uh, my dog will basically um, be a continuation of the talk of uh, Professor Helen Dammer of two weeks ago. Uh, but I will focus more on the, the late evolution of uh, terrestrial planets, and I will give a focus on the role of the host star on the evolution of uh, Earth-like atmospheres and of so-called Earth-like habitats. We'll a little bit discuss the role of the galaxy in uh, the prevalence of Earth-like habitats, and we'll just to finish also discuss a little bit of further parameters that may affect its their evolution and uh, discuss a bit of problems that may occur around M dwarfs. Uh, and first of all, I want to reiterate something that uh, Helmut Lamm already uh, said last week. So what actually we understand under Earth, uh, as an Earth-like habitat. So you see on uh, the figure on the left, uh, that's a figure that we just, from a paper that we resubmitted this week uh, to astrobiology, which shows some pressure limits uh, for, for which uh, complex aerobic life may obey. But uh, be aware that we define complex aerobic life as millimeter to meter sized oxygen briefing metasoans with a blood circulatory system, so basically advanced animals. So, and be also aware that, of course, those toxicity limits are based on Earth like life. So, on other planets, uh, they may evolve to withstand other toxicity limits for CO2 and N2. But it's a good starting point if you want to investigate a certain planetary atmospheres and what that may mean for the prevalence in the galaxy and on terrestrial planets. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit of O2 because there are indeed uh, hard physical limits that uh, animals or that complex life has to obey. Uh, because if you go, if you really want to, uh, so oxygen is the most important energy giver, basically. So the only element that can uh, provide more energy would be fluorine which is relatively rare and which may be quite uncommon in biological activities. So most of complex life forms may uh, need oxygen to uh, to cover their energy needs. And to do that, uh, you will need some kind of a circulatory system that brings the oxygen uh, into your body if you have uh, a body that is, that is bigger than in the centimeter range. And for that to work, uh, you have to overcome a physical barrier, which is about one centimeter, because below that, uh, the circulatory systems do not work a bit due to physical effects like adhesion, for example. Uh, so below that area, you are relying on diffusion. And for that, you need a certain O2 atmospheric pressure. And that's in the order of 10 to 100 millibar. So that's needed mm -hmm. that you can indeed uh, build up a body that is about one centimeter in size so that you can subsequently evolve some kind of a circulatory system to uh, really uh, grow bigger bodies. Uh, for CO2 and for N2, uh, it's those are really based on toxicity limits of animal life here on Earth, so that may be indeed different on other planets, of course. But for the Earth, at least, uh, animal life is uh, known to not to not be able to survive uh, partial pressures of CO2 uh, in the order of 100 bar millibars and above. And for N2, you can uh, you can derive similar uh, partial pressure limits, like around 200 millibars, as found in study by since 2020. And the interesting thing is that if you take those uh, CO2 pressure limits for complex life as we know it, uh, you can, Schwiedermann et al. 2019 were the first to define the habitable zone for complex life. Uh, because if you assume that uh, your planet can only have a maximum of 0.1 bar CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, your habitable zone will shrink significantly. Because in the uh, conventional habitable zone, uh, the outer limits of the habitable zone, so the region where water can be liquid on the surface, is heavily relying on a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere to, to warm the planet up, basically. So you, you, you need several bars of CO2 in the atmosphere. But if you only can have 0.1 bar in the atmosphere, your habitable zone uh, shrinks significantly. And Schwitter et al. calculated that to be about 32% of the conventional habitable zone for a solar-like star if you assume a, a, a 0.1 bar CO2 atmosphere. And that also means, of course, that uh, rocky exoplanets are within a habitable zone of complex life uh, would be less uh, uh, abundant than within the habitable zone. And based on this, we defined our earth like habitats uh, as a rocky exoplanet with an N2O2 dominated atmosphere with minor amounts of CO2 that orbits inside the habitable zone of complex life. And as you will we'll see in a few slides, that's very important if you want to uh, investigate uh, around which stars those planets or those atmospheres can indeed be stable. But first of all, I want to uh, introduce a little bit, give a little bit of an introduction into uh, upper atmospheres. So on the left, you see a sketch of Earth's atmosphere. You see the lower atmosphere. And the more important part for our studies is uh, the upper atmosphere, so the thermosphere, ranging from the mesobase up to the exobase. 
whereas the exobase is uh, the region in the atmosphere where the where the, the, the gas basically comes collisionless. So basically, the upper atmosphere is just a thermosphere ranging up towards the exobase. And as you can see, for the Earth, even though the, the surface temperature is below, on average, below 100 Kelvin, uh, the thermosphere is quite hot. So you can reach temperatures up to 1,000 Kelvin, and it's quite extended as well, as up to 800 to 1,000 kilometers above the surface. And the reason for that is that uh, the short wavelength radiation of the sun, so the, the X-ray radiation and the extreme ultraviolet radiation uh, with wavelengths below about uh, 100 nanometers, uh, together also called XUV, is absorbed in the thermosphere, in the upper atmosphere. And this heats up the, the upper atmosphere and expands and uh, is much hotter than, than the lower atmosphere, at least for nitrogen-dominated atmospheres. And that's interesting because uh, in neuronomy, you can define a relatively simple parameter called Gene's escape parameter lambda, which you may be aware of, which is basically just the ratio of uh, the gravitational potential of a planet versus the thermal energy of a particle at the exobase. And you see this lambda value becomes uh, lower if you increase the exobase temperature and if you increase the exobase radius. And interestingly, if this lambda value falls below a value around two to three, uh, your, 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 your particles have such a high thermal energy that uh, your atmosphere will not be stable anymore. It's not bound to the planet anymore. And your particles will just escape into space. And that's happening on a very fast base. So it's, it's called hydrodynamic escape. And your atmosphere, if you have a one bar atmosphere, uh, this can escape into the space within just in a million years time scale. But geologically speaking, that's very fast. Um, if you are above a lambda value of six, your atmosphere becomes slowly stable. You will still have escape, but it's uh, relatively insignificant. And for Earth, you are somewhere in the range of 50, 40 to 50. So our atmosphere at present is certainly stable. And then you also have non-thermal escape, which is basically escape induced due to interactions with the solar or the stellar wind, or with the magnetosphere, like your polar outflow at the Earth, iron outflow uh, over the, the open field lines of our magnetosphere, uh, for instance. And this can also be important at later stages of planetary evolution, and thermal escape will not be important anymore. And uh, you can make quite interesting simulations with that. So here on, on the left, you see simulations by Janet R2008 uh, with a 1D hydrodynamic upper atmosphere model. And you again see temperature profiles, this time only of the uh, upper atmosphere. So uh, you see again the thermosphere, basically, so the upper atmosphere. Uh, and on top of the lines, there is the exobase, so the end of the upper atmosphere. And the numbers on top just mean uh, the XUV flux that are uh, irradiated onto those, those atmospheres. And it's just present-day Earth's atmosphere, so nitrogen, oxygen dominated with only 400 ppm CO2. And one means basically the present-day flux, so one times the present-day XUV flux at the Earth. And you see, as before, that the temperature is in the order of 1,000 Kelvin on top, and it's a little bit below 1,000 uh, kilometers in extension. But if you increase the XUV flux, uh, your atmosphere, nitrogen will absorb more and more of the short wavelength radiation and preheat up and expand. So you see here for 1.5 times the present day XV flux, you can go further and further and further. And if you are in the range of 5 to 6 to 7 times the present day XV flux, uh, you see that your X of the, the upper atmosphere will become very hot. So it's then suddenly in the range of 10,000 Kelvin. And uh, it has an extension that, that goes up to 10,000 kilometers or even more. That's more than a ra the radius of the Earth. And here it, becomes, here it gets interesting. Because suddenly you see that around 6.6 .6 times the present XUV uh, flux value, uh, you suddenly get some uh, temperature maximum somewhere in the upper atmosphere. And that's when the atmosphere starts to adiabatically expand. And basically, at this point, your lambda value becomes so low uh, and your atmosphere is not bound to the planet anymore. So it will start to expand into space and will be lost very quickly. And if you increase the XUV flux even higher, you see for 20 times the present the value the atmosphere, the short-lived atmosphere, because it escapes, it escapes into space thermally, uh, would be expanded even above the present-day magnetopause range, which is, about, which is about 10 to 11 times the radius of the Earth. So such an atmos atmosphere cannot be stable anymore. So if your star has an XUV flux uh, that is higher than that, or that is in this range, uh, you cannot have a stable nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. And that's quite important if you want to investigate whether a star can host Earth-like atmospheres in the habitable, in, in habitable zone. But there is another interesting thing with that. Uh, and nitrogen itself, 
is not an infrared cooler. So it does not absorb short wavelength radiation and reabsorbs it at infrared wavelengths, but CO2 on the other hand is. So it absorbs an XU reflux and it re emits it in the infrared. And that's a bad thing for the lower atmosphere present here on Earth because uh, it heats up the lower atmosphere. Uh, because the infrared is just cannot escape from the lower atmosphere because it is so dense and it just heats up the atmosphere. But in the upper atmosphere, uh, the gas is so tenuous that the absorbed short wavelength radiation, which is re emitted at infrared, can just escape back into space. So CO2 basically cools the upper atmosphere. So it makes it more compact and colder. And uh, so if you increase the mixing ratio of CO2 in your atmosphere, your atmosphere will become more stable. It will become colder and more compact. And on the right, you see a, 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 a plot from a study that we made in 2021, also with some uh, upper atmosphere model. And this time you don't see uh, atmospheric profiles of the upper atmospheres, but just the exobase levels, so the, the end of the upper atmosphere. Uh, for different CO2 mixing ratios and for different uh, XUV fluxes. And you see, again, on top, uh, you see uh, the, the X-ray value in this case uh, as a function of present-day flux at Earth. And if you take 1% CO2, uh, that's the orange line, uh, you see that if you increase the XUV flux to about, again, six times the present-day value, your exobase will increase and uh, your atmosphere will become unstable and escape into space. So whether you have 400 ppm CO2 or 1% CO2 doesn't matter so much because the value is quite low. But if you go to higher mixing CO2 mixing ratios in your atmosphere, your atmosphere will become more stable. So then you see that the violet curve, which is the 10% CO2 case. So you have a mixing ratio of 10% CO2, the rest is nitrogen. And you see that in this case, you can already withstand an XUV flux in the range of 8 to 10 times the present day flux. And these 10% are quite inter interesting because if you take a one bar uh, nitrogen dominated atmosphere, and you have 10% CO2, that's about 100 millibar CO2, and that's about the toxicity level for uh, animal life here on Earth. So if we define Earth-like habitat with a maximum of 10% CO2 in its atmosphere, we will specifically focus on this on this particular case. And of course, if you go further to the right and to higher mixing ratios, you will see that your atmosphere can withstand even higher XUV fluxes. But even if you take a pure CO2 atmosphere, uh, and you see the red line with the 99% CO2 case, at some point, even here, your atmosphere will start to heat up and to expand, specifically because the CO2 will just be uh, dissociated by the high uh, radiation, and you lose your infrared coolant that your atmosphere will still escape into space. Um, and very nicely visualized if you compare Mars, Venus, and Earth, for instance. Uh, so you see again uh, the upper atmospheres of those planets, so uh, Mars, Venus, and Earth. And you see that Mars and Venus uh, have CO2-dominated atmospheres, Earth has a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. And you see that Mars and Venus have much more compact atmospheres, even though Mars is only, is only a tenth of the mass of the Earth. And Venus is smaller than the Earth. Uh, it's only 80% of its mass, and it's uh, uh, closer to the Sun. But nevertheless, the atmospheres are much more compact and much colder. So the exobase, they have temperatures around 200 Kelvin, and they're only about 200 kilometers high compared to the Earth, as you can see here with about 1,000 Kelvin and a height of about 500 kilometers. And interestingly, of course, if you would give Venus a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere, its atmosphere would look completely different. So the, the dotted line that you see on the right of the plot uh, just illustrates how Venus' atmosphere would, would look like if you, at present day, if you would, would give it a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. So due to the higher XU reflux, due to the lower mass, it would be much more expanded and it would be much more hotter. So escape rates from, from Venus, of course, would also increase. And the same is true for Mars. So if you put, would put Mars onto one AU uh, on Earth's orbit, its atmosphere would also increase. But due to being CO2, uh, it would st still be less expanded than the Earth's one, much colder, even though it is only 10% of its mass. So this illustrates the importance of CO2 in an atmosphere as an infrared coolant and for, for stabilizing uh, secondary atmospheres. And there's another interesting thing. Of course, because uh, we are talking only from the present day, but stars, of course, evolve. It's true for the sun. It's also true for other stars, for M-dwarfs or K-dwarfs and for, for solar like stars in general. And uh, when stars are born, uh, they are born with different rotation rates and they are born with different XUV fluxes. So the, while the polarimetric luminosity in increases over time, which leads to an increase in temperature at Earth over time, of course, uh, the, the XUV flux decreases with time, and that's related to the rotation rate of the star, which decreases over time as well. And uh, it's quite a busy plot, but I will guide you through it. 
Uh, so here you see from two studies from 2015, the gray lines in the background, and from Johnson et al., the more important uh, part of the plot uh, from 2021, from some stellar evolution model uh, based on observations of stellar clusters of different ages. Uh, you see the, the evolution of XUV flux, uh, of XUV surface flux in the habitable zones of those stars of different stellar masses. And uh, you also see different uh, colors. So you see red, green, and blue lines. And those basically uh, coincide uh, with so-called slow, moderate, and fast rotators. So the red lines that you see that initially rotate slower, relatively slowly, while the, the red green lines are the moderate rotators that uh, rotate initially on average speed, while the, the blue line are fast rotators initially. So if you take a stellar distribution or rotational distribution of a newly born stars, then the, the black, the, the blue line, just the 95th percentile, the, the green line, the moderate rotator, the 50th percentile, and the red line, the fifth percentile, so very slowly rotating stars. And connected to that is the XUV flux, of course. So if your star rotates faster early on, the XUV flux will be higher. But since stars decelerate, their rotation, the XUV flux will also decelerate. And as you can see, at some certain point in time, all those different tracks converge. And another interesting thing on this plot, so I illustrated uh, this and do atmosphere stability threshold uh, for a, a nitrogen dominated atmosphere with 10% CO2 with this horizontal black line. So stars that are above those lines in their evolution, they have an XUV flux in the habitable zone that is too strong to allow the thermal stability of an Earth-like atmosphere. If you are below this line, uh, the, the star allows for an Earth-like atmosphere in its habitable zone. And as you can see for the solar-like star, uh, this threshold limit will be reached around 1 billion years, depending on which star you take. But if you go to, to lower stellar masses, you see that it will take more and more and more time that those stars indeed uh, reach this threshold limit. Difficult to very, so it can take billions of years. And difficult to very low mass stars in the M12 regime, you may never reach this threshold limit. So around low mass M12 uh, nitrogen dominated atmospheres may potentially never be stable. So you cannot have F Earth like uh, atmospheres in the habitable zones of uh, low mass M12, at least not in theory. In, in reality, probably, of course, uh, some stars will be less active than others, and you will have anomalously active stars, like the sun, for instance, and then you may or even be able to have lots of atmospheres around M dwarfs, but that may be rare. So the gray lines, the background show you uh, the sun, uh, the same evolution, but scale to the sun at present day, and to see that the, the activity of the sun is far below the average activity of solar like stars. So the sun actually is an anomalously uh, weakly active uh, solar-like star, and I'm wondering whether this is a coincidence or whether this has some specific reason that we are around such, that we are around such a star with such a weak activity. Uh, so that's important for pollution of nitrogen-dominated atmospheres. As you can see, not all stars in the galaxy can indeed host nitrogen-dominated atmospheres because they, they are just too active uh, in the short wavelength range of the spectrum. I will come back to that a little bit later, but I will briefly talk about the so-called galactic habitable zone, because it's also important if you want to estimate the prevalence of Earth-like habitats in the galaxy. And here uh, I show a little bit about stellar metallicity. So on the left, you see a plot from Johnson and Lee 2012. Uh, it's quite old already, but nothing has basically changed since then, uh, where you see all the discovered uh, exoplanets at that time as a function of distance from its host stars and as a function of stellar metallicity, uh, with the sun being at zero. And uh, you see that most of the stars are above uh, minus 0 0.5. And until now, no rocky exoplanet has been found that is below 0 0.5, a uh, minus 0 0.5. So you can expect that uh, stars with very low metallicities, so with uh, low content of uh, elements heavier than helium, uh, can probably not form rocky exoplanets. And that's particularly interesting if you uh, take a look at our galaxy and at the evolution of our galaxy. So on the right, you see a plot, uh, two plots from the study, from another study that we resubmitted this week. On top, you see data from a Hayden et al. 2015 who mapped uh, the average metallicity uh, within the galaxy. And you see on the x-axis the distance from the, galacto, from the galactic center in kiloparsec, starting from two kiloparsec from the center. And on the z-axis, z-axis, you see the galactocentric height. And uh, you see that metallicity increases towards the center, of course, because there are no more supernovae. There are, uh, 
and uh, it decreases generally towards the outer skirts of the galaxy, and it also uh, decreases if you go higher up into the galaxy. And on the bottom, you see uh, simulations by Snaefit R2015, who show how metallicity evolved in the outer and in the inner disk of the Milky Way, where the inner disk basically just is everything inside uh, the solar orbit around a kiloparsec from the center. And uh, the outer disk is everything outside. And you see that early on in the history of the Milky Way, of course, the metallicity was very low. So, so extremely low that rocky exoplanets may not have been able to form. So old stars may not have rocky exoplanets or less rocky exoplanets than newer stars. And uh, you can take those distributions and just put them into a mod. Oh, yeah. First of all, I just uh, want to talk a little bit more about this galactic habitable zone. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with the concept of the galactic habitable zone, so it's it's basically investigating where in the galaxy uh, habitable planets can indeed form. And it's based, mostly based on aforementioned metallicity distribution in the galaxy, on uh, the dynamical stability of uh, stellar systems, and specifically also on the radiation environment within the galaxy. So if you have many and supernovae uh, exploding uh, close by your stellar system, then your, your planets will be sterilized and complex life may not be able to evolve over a certain time frame. And on this plot, you see basically the probability, uh, again, as a uh, function uh, of distance from the, galactus and from the galactic center in, Kilo, in, in Basak this time, uh, and the probability that a planet, that a star basically has a high enough metallicity to allow for rocky exoplanets, and uh, that the stellar system is not be sterilized by supernova. And you see uh, from the lines on the bottom, basically, that uh, the highest probability for a habitable planet in the galactic in the galactic disk is somewhere, in most of the studies, somewhere around the sun, uh, somewhere in the region where the sun is located. Uh, I want to particularly point towards the, the black lines, which only uh, takes into account sterilization by supernova, which is from Gauin Lockheed R 2011. So you see that the, the probability of being sterilized by supernova is very, of being not sterilized by supernova is very high towards the center uh, because uh, there are many the probability of being sterilized by supernova is very high towards the center because there are many supernovae. While if you go towards the outer skirts of the galaxy, you will find that uh, your probability of being sterilized is much lower. And for metallicity, it's the other way around. So you will find more habitable planets towards the center than uh, towards the outer skirts of the galaxy. And with those data, you can uh, basically make a model. And it's also from the study from that we, we submitted this week, uh, where I see on, on the Top left, you see the distribution of stars in the galactic disk, again, as a function of galactocentric distance on the uh, x-axis and as a function of galactocentric height on the y-axis, uh, based on a model by Macmillan 2017. You find around 100 million stars in this uh, galactic region, and you see that most of the stars are located towards the galactic center. And if you then implement uh, the probability distribution by Gauin log, for instance, that you are uh, stars or stellar systems are sterilized by supernova, then you find, of course, of course, in the figure on the top right, that most of your stars in the that are sterilized by supernova are towards the center. So most of the stars that are towards the center actually kicked out of the sample. So you see that suddenly most of the stars that are yet in the sample were not sterilized by supernova, somewhere uh, close to the sun, to the sun's location in the disk, maybe a little bit inside, around 6 to 7 to 8 kiloparsec from the center. Uh, this uh, sample of stars can also be visualized in a different way. So on the bottom right figure, you see the same sample of stars, but this time as a function of uh, birth age on the x-axis and as a function of stellar mass on the y-axis. So that's all presently existing stars in the galaxy that are not sterilized by supernovae. And you see that most of those stars are very old, low mass M dwarfs, basically. That, are, that were born towards the beginning of the Milky Way and are very low mass. But if you also include uh, those metallicity uh, distributions, you will find that most of the old low mass stars will be kicked out from the sample and you somehow homogenize your sample as you see on the bottom left figure. Nevertheless, the stars in the galaxy uh, that can, in principle, host habitable planets are yet uh, located towards old low mass M, star M stars. And just by taking account of this galactic habitable zone, you can um, uh, find out that about 20%, roughly speaking, of stars in the galaxy at present could, in principle, host habitable planets. But now you can take the sample of stars and can also implement a threshold for the stability of 
of like atmospheres. So you can check via stellar evolution model that I've shown you early on, uh, which of those stars that are yet in the sample can indeed host uh, Earth like atmospheres. And you can do that for atmospheres with, for instance, 10%, with a mixing ratio of 10% CO2, which are more stable, and with atmospheres with a mixing ratio of 1% CO2, which are, which are less stable, but are more close to uh, the atmosphere we have here at present day. And if you do that, uh, you find that uh, most of the, all of your low-mass stars basically are kicked out of the samples. On the left, you see uh, this for nitrogen-dominated atmospheres with 10% CO2, and on the right, you see it with just 1% CO2. And you see that for the 1% CO2 case, you have less stars available because uh, the, the, the atmosphere is just uh, less stable, and that means that you only have weak, more weakly active stars in your sample than for the 10% CO2 case. And you also see that basically most of your M dwarfs are kicked out of the samples because uh, the Earth-like atmospheres are basically not stable around most of uh, M dwarf systems. And on the bottom figure, you see the same uh, distribution of stars, but just as a function of stellar mass and number of stars. And you see that you somehow uh, get some kind of a cut of uh, stellar mass below which Earth-like atmospheres will not be stable. But I again point out that this is just based on, on models and there will be M dwarfs that are less active and some that will be more active. So you may indeed in reality find uh, nitrogen dominant atmospheres potentially even around M dwarf stars. Um, but if you indeed take into account uh, the stability factor of, of like atmospheres, you find that around 1% of stars in the galaxy at present may be able to host uh, Earth like atmospheres. So by far not all stars that are presently existing in the galactic disk provide habitable condition for, conditions for Earth-like habitats. Uh, you could uh, extend this, of course, to also some planetary parameters, uh, which are less well understood at present. Uh, you could implement also the planet occurrence rate, which is uh, in the habitable zone, which is relatively poorly understood for solar-like stars. So you see that the values range from about 1% to about 30% from recent literature over the last uh, five years. You see in the figure on the right, you see from several different studies, uh, the occurrence rate, rates of rocky exoplanets in the habitable zones, and those are the black lines, and the orange lines scale to the habitable zone of complex life from the study that we submitted recently. And yeah, there's a wide spread, but you could implement that from minimum to maximum values. You could do the same with uh, planets that have a specific amount of water, for instance. Uh, you may count you, you may argue that uh, oceans and subaerial land may be, may be needed at the same time for complex life to evolve. If so, that the fraction of planets that may indeed host such a fraction of water might be relatively low, as theoretically studies show. And then, for instance, you could also take account of uh, the importance of large moons. But I want to point out that uh, this is highly debated. So you may be uh, familiar with the rare Earth hypothesis by Warden Brownlee who famously argued that uh, a large moon is needed uh, for uh, complex life to work because it stabilizes uh, a planet's obliquity, so the, the planetary axis. But we know, now know that this is not the case, so you can also have stable planetary obliquities for uh, if you don't have a large moon, and who, who says that if your planetary axis is not stable, that complex uh, life would nevertheless evolve. But there are some other quite interesting arguments that point towards the direction that a large moon indeed aids towards uh, the evolution of Earth-like habitats. If you would uh, also include that uh, into uh, your sample of remaining stars, uh, from minimum to maximum value to the liquid, you find that uh, something interesting, as, as you can see on the plot in the top left corner of, of the slide, you will find that uh, the occurrence rate of Earth-like habitats so of Earth-like of planets with Earth-like atmospheres may be the highest around uh, stellar masses around uh, 0.8 solar masses, so somewhere in the K-type dwarf regime. And that's quite interesting. So I only know, I know of two studies that uh, did some similar studies. Uh, that's Kunz et al. 2015 and Lincoln and Klöp 2021, and they came to a similar result. So it seems likely that Earth-like planets uh, with Earth-like atmospheres may indeed most come in around a stellar mass around 0.8 and not in, in the G-type regime. And as you can see on the numbers below, uh, nevertheless, the occurrence rate of those stars may be pretty low, specifically if you compare it with uh, our values for the occurrence rate of rocky exoplanets within the habitable zone. So the important takeaway here is that not any 
rocky exoplanets within exoplanets within the habitable zone will indeed evolve towards a habitable planet on which complex uh, life may indeed evolve. But those results certainly should also be taken with caution because our knowledge is relatively fully constrained at present, specifically for planetary parameters. And some of these parameters may also be interrelated, so you cannot simply multiply them. And, and otherwise, you might uh, underestimate the number of Earth like planets in the galaxy. Uh, at that, of course, I want to point out that there are several other parameters that feed into the evolution of habitable planets, which I just quickly mention here a few of them. So, of course, uh, there are all other sterilization events going on in the galaxy, like gamma ray bursts, for instance, which can render your planet uninhabitable. Uh, the habitability of binary stars may be different than the habitability of single stars. Then the galactic distribution of short-lived radioactive nuclei are quite important because uh, they only have half-lives in the order of 500,000 years. and uh, they are very important for early planet formation and for really heating up the planet to such an extent that you can differentiate your planet. Interesting, the sun had anomalously high values of aluminum-26 uh, when the planets formed. Uh, so something like supernovae or wolf riots, the, the stellar winds or so on, must have uh, delivered uh, these radioactive elements to the sun. And not all of the stars in the galaxy will, will adhere to these conditions. The stellar plasma environment, as I already said, is quite important for non firm escape of planetary atmospheres. So interactions with the stellar wind and the atmospheres, particularly around M dwarfs, can be very important for atmospheric erosion. So this can even erode atmospheres for longer time scales than firm escape via the irradiation of the star. Then you have stellar flares, which can also erode your atmosphere, which can erode your ozone, which is of course bad for life. But on the other hand, it may also aid prebiotic chemistry around low mass stars due to an higher UV energy input than from the quiet star itself. And then there's also the, the case with the UV habitability. So if your UV flux is too low, no prebiotic chemistry may take place on your planet. And you cannot build up, you may not have the origin of life and you cannot build up a complex biosphere. And on the plot that you see on the right uh, by Spinelli at R2023, you see a comparison of the conventional habitable zone in green with the UV habitable zone. So where the, the UV flux at, in the habit, uh, at the planet is high enough to allow for prebiotic chemistry. And you see that both uh, do not converge until something like 0.7 stellar masses. So everything below that I might have a UV flux that is too low to really allow for prebiotic chemistry. So flares might indeed be important to increase this energy available, but that's really walking on a very thin line since flares will also destroy your ozone and, and erode your atmosphere in addition to the quiet uh, irradiation of your star. And of course, you also have several other uh, planetary and biological parameters that may feed in the habitability of a planet, like planetary accretion speed, which was talked by Helmut Lammer for two weeks ago uh, quite extensively. So if your planet accretes too fast within the uh, planetary, within the solar nebula, within the stellar nebula, it may create a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere and may uh, turn out to be uninhabitable. The radioactive heat budget of a planet uh, so that the planet doesn't cool fast enough. You may must have long-term working carbon silicate, nitrogen, oxygen cycles, which is again strongly correlated with the radioactive heat budget, with biology and with water availability, for instance. You need the availability of volatiles such as CO2 and N2, which is not uh, certain if your planet is active for a very long time. You may have lost all of it and cannot outguess a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere after your, your star is inactive enough. You may need an intrinsic magnetic field, but it's strongly debated at the moment. And you, for building up an N2 O2 dominated atmosphere, you will also need or the origin of life and photosynthesis, of course. And finally, I just briefly want to mention some further problems that may occur on M dwarfs. So, about the most abundant stars in the galaxy with stellar masses below around 0.5 solar masses, which make up about 80% of all stars in the galaxy. There are several different uh, factors or problems that are relevant and that might strongly reduce the habitability of planets around M stars. As I already said, said the XUV radiation. So TRAPPIST-1, for instance, is between 7 and 8 giga, giga years old, but it still has an XUV flux in its habitable zone that's about up to 100 times higher compared to the Earth at present day. So no nitrogen-dominant atmosphere can be stable on these planets based on the thermal argument presented before. And even if those star, stars reach radiation limits that are suitable to sustain Earth-like atmospheres after billions of years, 
The question is, are there yet any volatiles left to be outgassed? Is the planet yet geologically active to allow for outgassing? Then you have the strong flaring activity that can destroy a zone that can evaporate your atmosphere. You have strong stellar, wind, stellar winds that will erode your atmospheres as well. The planets may likely be tightly locked, which might pose some problems, but uh, whether this indeed infects habitability is relatively unclear at the moment, I would say. Then strong stellar magnetic fields uh, of M dwarfs can lead to induction heating, which heats up your planet and which will lead to strong volcanism or either to magma oceans on the subsurface or on the surface, which certainly is not a good uh, argument for habitability. As already said, the energy received from the star may be too low to permit photosynthesis, even though there are some recent papers that uh, argue in the direction that photosynthesis will be possible, but likely on a limited range than it is here on Earth, and maybe too limited to allow for complex biospheres. You uh, And of course, as already said, uh, the reflux may be too low to allow for prebiotic chemistry. Uh, the carbonate rattering, though, so the, the carbonate silica cycle may may work too fast to, to take the CO2 out from the atmosphere, so your planet might cool too fast. Uh, and the polarimetric luminosity at, uh, of the, the M dwarf might increase too little to counteract that, so your planet may, may just freeze after some certain time. Uh, planets around M dwarfs may mostly end up with either large water reservoirs with oceans that are so thick that uh, a nutrient exchange between the silicate mantle and the ocean may be prohibited, or they will just end up as desert planets because of high uh, water escape into space. So it's very difficult to really find some, some water range that may fit for M dwarfs. There's a very low chance of forming large moons if it is impossible because the hill radius of your planet around uh, is so so small because other planets are so close to the host star. A biotic oxygen build up due to water escape may restrict the origin of life, which may indeed need uh, reduced conditions uh, to happen, or which may favor reduced conditions. And even and those planets may also not receive enough reduced compounds via uh, asteroids or comets for kickstarting prebiotic chemistry because it takes so long for those systems to evolve that. Basically, the, the bombardment with asteroids and comets uh, already ended when you when the origin of life would actually be possible. And yeah, just as a brief summary, as I already said, Earth-like atmospheres are not very stable against firmly escape into space. So the higher the CO2 mixing ratios, uh, the higher the stability of those atmospheres. And on this, we based our uh, definition of Earth-like habitats. And uh, the XV surface flux in the habitable zone uh, decreases over time, which takes longer for lower mass stars and to fall below a specific threshold level that allows for its stability, which means that uh, low mass M dwarfs may never reach a stability threshold to allow for Earth like atmos atmospheres to evolve on such planets. And that also means that not all stars in the galactic disk can indeed host Earth like habitats due to the, the named factors. And uh, stars with a stellar mass around 0.8. Uh, solar masses might indeed be the most favorable stars for hosting of the like habitats. And yeah, with that, I, I leave you with a thank you and I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much.